Hello role-playing people and in this episode we're going to talk about what I like to call non-threatening evil antagonists. As you're about to see, their opposition to the protagonists is mainly a moral opposition, very discreet at first and it's done without any intention to harm or create difficulties for the main characters. This kind of antagonist is here to challenge what your PCs think is excusable acceptable, and to present them with a difficult but genuine moral choice. As such, the term antagonist isn't the best one. The character really is more of a, a challenger rather than someone who directly opposes the protagonist, but this is the word we'll use for now. In my experience, this is some of the most genuine kind of evil you can have in an RPG. And it needs to be said, because this depiction of evil is inspired by real-life behaviors of sexual sadists, serial killers, and, well, interviews with their victims, it can have a prolonged emotional impact on players. Some people just don't want to have this level of uh, grit or realism in their games, which is fine, perfectly understandable, because we are playing RPGs predominantly to have a good time. Not all representations of evil need to be heartbreakingly authentic, fit for tragedies and horror games. No, in, in most scenarios, especially in sword and sorcery, fantasy games, the villain isn't too morally ambiguous, so player characters can clearly tell, oh yeah, that, that person is evil and needs to be stopped by any means. And the manifestations or deeds of the evil character are so grandiose and their plan so over the top that it doesn't really feel personal or feels like it bears genuine moral implications. The result is we end up with an almost cartoony scenario in which the obviously evil evildoer who is most likely an outcast to the community threatens to destroy the entire community the protagonists belong to or care about for whatever reason. Revenge, lust for power, greed, you name it. But the protagonists are made aware of what is often called a great evil in the land, which threatens everyone, so they track down the antagonist, discover their heinous plan, which is undoubtedly evil, because again, it threatens the existence or well-being of everyone in the community. And when the antagonist gets the chance to interact with a party before the awesome and quite inevitable combat scene, they will probably try some cheap deception or some pretty unconvincing manipulation. You know, some, uh, join me and I will give you power, join me and I will spare you, which apparently gives the players uh, a moral choice to make, but it never is an actual choice. Because both the storyteller and the players know this is an evil bastard who's lying through his teeth and wants to destroy everyone. If you submit to an evil abuser, you will not be spared, nor exalted, but abused and finally destroyed. So, of course, the protagonists say no. Upon hearing their refusal to join in on the evil plan, the antagonist probably giggles arrogantly <laughs> or goes into a rage and proceeds to attack the party with increasingly powerful spells while bringing in a horde of minions as well. Thus, the protagonists have to defend themselves to survive and the antagonist is clearly being threatening and unreasonable to the extent that aggression cannot be avoided, so fighting back with lethal force bears no serious moral consequences for the protagonists, since uh, that aggression is dictated by the, their need to survive. They will not feel sorry for destroying the, uh, the antagonist, and they certainly didn't start the hostilities. It was the villain. So they destroy the evil bastard and save the day, returning to their communities to be hailed as heroes or champions, receiving rewards, status, drinks, and what have you. It's a fun experience for sure, with intense epic combat that has you at the edge of your seat, awesome rewards as the protagonists obtain recognition and are treated as heroes of the realm, but there's no real character depth 
no genuine moral choice. And this approach presents a pretty childish, toned-down depiction of evil like the antagonists we see in children's cartoons. It's typical garden variety evil, no matter how grandiose its plan. Uh, and sometimes the plan is so grandiose, it's so over the top, it, it creates an exaggerated and caricaturized depiction of how real evil manifests. In a game such as Vampire the Masquerade, you can undoubtedly use the threatening evil antagonist, you know, like the ever-present Sabbat Raid, the flesh-shaping monster, whatever. I've done it many times, and I trust so have you. But because of the personal and societal horror players can also explore if they want to, we can make our potential villain so much more authentic and impactful. Be warned though, interacting with such an entity will leave the players feeling disempowered, confused, frustrated, angry, and bitter. I am about to describe this type of character and potential interactions with it, and it will not be pleasant to listen to. If things become too much, dear listener, please take a break from this or just skip this episode. As a player or storyteller, if you're not interested in portraying a visceral and gritty and authentic evil character leaning heavily into themes of societal horror, real horror, abuse, then there is no need to listen to this. For those who are still here, let's begin. The character I'm thinking of doesn't behave like an evil outsider to the community. Not in the slightest. Not at all. They blend in quite well in both kindred and mortal societies, especially in mortal society, and their determination, competence, and ruthlessness has earned them quite some status in Camarilla hierarchy. Maybe they're a keeper of Elysium, a chancellor, a sheriff, or a primogen, so they are wealthy and influential. However, despite the usual arrogance high status figures display over their lessers, this character always presents as benevolent, especially to the protagonists. Whether we're talking assistance in combat, a cleanup that protects the masquerade, or financial aid, this is someone they can rely on, someone they can consistently rely on, uh, someone they can confide in, an experienced kindred who has been where they are now and who makes them feel at ease and safe without casting any judgment on the protagonist's actions, flaws, or desires. A perfect mentor, keeper of order, and valuable member of the Camarilla. And then, a dark secret rears its ugly head. It's a rumor, at first, undoubtedly a lie, spread by politically motivated enemies of this character. They are saying your friend is a sadist, who particularly enjoys young victims, women and children. We all know kindred are far superior to mortals, not only in terms of physicality, but in terms of supernatural charm and command. Hurting the innocent and helpless would be so easy, and is so easy for your kind, it can be done with absolute discretion. It's uh, very unlikely any vampire engaging in such practices would ever be caught and brought to justice by mortal authorities. But why are you even listening to this? No, not your friend. These are lies, there is no way this can be true. He's been nothing but kind and present and caring. Except it's true. And you can find out in many ways, such as monitoring their activities from the shadows or having allies and contacts, check missing persons reports, or simply by confronting them. This last suggestion is my favorite as storyteller because it gives the sadistic monster a chance to casually confess to everything to the protagonists, being completely honest as if his activities were nothing, no big deal. And truth be told, by kindred law, by the traditions themselves, it really is no big deal. 
Nowhere in the traditions does it say you can't be a sadist, or that sadism towards mortals is directly punished in any way. As long as the kindred is discreet about their doing and doesn't threaten the masquerade, no one cares. And it becomes clear this person has a near flawless system for abusing their preferred victim type, because truth be told, had you not pursued that rumor known only among the society of the undead, and had you not known exactly where to look and who to monitor, you would have never known this is happening, just like you haven't known or have had any confirmation until this very night, the night of the confession, when your supposed friend just uh, casually confesses to their deeds, even going into details, if you want to know, how he repeatedly suffocates his victims before moving on to mutilation or the use of fire. And as he realizes he gave away the fact that he enjoys this, he switches tactic. In his usual friendly manner, the character explains that it's a part of his curse or a compulsion, or a kind of supernatural flaw, something they can't really control, even though they initially tried. They tried really hard. But hey, we're all predators of the night here, right? We're all vampires here? It's similar to a Ventru's feeding restriction, if said Ventru would only receive nourishment from the blood of torture victims. It's not his fault that he has to engage in this kind of behavior, and though he might even show remorse for his deeds. His secret behavior also cannot cease. This is the way things are. This is a requirement to his unlife. His survival and well-being depends on this. So this theoretically immortal monster who has servants and havens and all the money you could ever dream of will kidnap and torture women and children for the rest of eternity week after week without violating the masquerade, without really breaking any of the rules of kindred society, while actually being an important pillar of this community, the society of the undead. He can easily justify why he's doing this. He's a philosopher, a poet, the victim of a curse. And again, he doesn't threaten the protagonists in any way. This is why I call this type of character the non-threatening evil antagonist. Evil? Yes, by human standards, this is a sadistic monster who will not stop torturing helpless innocent victims until it is destroyed. But his preferred victim type isn't you. He doesn't want to hurt you. He doesn't want to destroy the community he is also part of. He doesn't want to bring about the end of the world. Just to be left to his own devices and continue to feed on the agony he's putting mortals through. So in this case, what can the protagonists do about it? Not much. If they decide to slay a Keeper or a Chancellor or a Primogen, the repercussions will be dire. They are as good as dead if they do that, because, remember now, the right to destruction belongeth only to thine Elder, the Sixth Tradition. As a matter of fact, should they so much as refuse to leave this person's domain when asked to, they are violating the Second Tradition. Thy domain is thy own concern, all others owe thee respect while in it. When this person says, leave me, you'd better leave. Should the protagonists naively try alerting the authorities, like the sheriff or even the prince, they will bluntly be told that the evildoer's deeds, tragic and unpleasant as they are, do not affect the Camarilla and the traditions in any negative way because the accused indulges their urges in a very discreet manner and has, so far, been nothing but an asset to the city. The way he uh, treats his herd is no one's concern but his. What, should the sheriff crack down on local Giovanni because their bites cause agony to mortals? Should they crack down on any kindred who gets a little rough with kine? No, the Camarilla is order and safety and secrecy, not kindness and empathy, especially not towards mortals. The kine are sheep 
you hide among. As long as you don't let the herd know you're the wolf and keep secrets secret, you can treat them any way you like. At this point, the protagonists who want to do the right thing might feel confused, lost, disempowered, angry, perfectly normal reactions when faced with the fact that this uh, kindred has been torturing women and children in prolonged sessions for weeks on end ever since his unlife began decades or centuries ago and everyone knew to some degree they didn't talk about it and the only reason you got wind of this is because someone didn't keep their mouth shut and made a little remark but everyone who matters in this city, they know. The Council of Primogen know and keep quiet because they have their own secrets. The Prince and his Sheriff and the Sheriff's Hounds know. And they don't care. No one cares. Moreover, if you try to take justice into your own hands, you will have violated the traditions and might be put to death. But it doesn't end here because... Even if the protagonists try to shut this out and stop thinking about it. Just ignore it. Just don't do anything about it. Their friend, their benefactor, will just keep doing this. And he smiles to them during Elysium gatherings, as always. And afterward, when you leave the club, you can see dumb happy mortal girls getting into the car thinking this person is their savior everything they ever wanted wealth power beauty and they have no clue of the fate that awaits them weeks or months of agony until they finally die you keep up with a missing children's list through your contacts and you know those children are being kidnapped by this kindred's retainers to be suffocated and dismembered and burnt alive. Some of them might still be alive right now in some torture chamber in one of his havens in this bloody city, kept alive in perpetual agony like a ghouled butterfly collection. And this person, oh, he smiles and waves to you before getting in that car, because you're their friend, their coterie mate, their protege, or whatever. He has always helped you. He's always cared about you. What can you do? What should you do? And it is at this point we realize that really is the question in a story about morality and horror, isn't it? What do you do? With non-threatening evil, the protagonists have a genuine choice of what to do throughout this entire horrifying story. And because they are not attacked in any way, they have no immediate justification or excuse for killing the antagonist. It's not self-defense. The protagonists themselves are in no danger. They are not his victim type. He didn't even put a finger on them. He never asked for their worship or recognition or allegiance like the uh, join me or die antagonists do. Oh no, he, he just wants their indifference and silence. Currently, and uh, previously it seemed like all he wanted was their friendship, right? A, a genuine collaboration. He might even reward their indifference, their silence in some way, right? Financially, or maybe he has some powerful artifacts he's willing to part with. The character is a valuable member of the undead community, and within that community, he is lawful, right? You can almost hear him say, just let me tend to my needs. It's my right to act the way I do, so judging me for it puts you in the wrong. We are all predators here, I just have special needs. Really, I'm a victim, if you look at it that way, I'm a person with special needs, special requirements. Fine, you want to judge me? Very well. I accept and respect your decision. But no, I will no longer assist you and you are no longer welcome on my domain. And it is you who is betraying this collaboration, not me. I'm not judging anyone and I'd never hurt a kindred, one of the blood. 
You want to hurt me? Go ahead, but I will defend myself if need be. I am someone in this city. I matter. Everyone can see I'm a worthy member of this community, and I assist the Prince and the Camarilla with all my resources and loyalty. Are you valuable and loyal and meaningful to someone? No. You're nobodies, some clueless fledglings or neonates who have no idea what I've endured. So, whatever you're thinking of doing, you can't get to me. And please, don't even try. Spare us both a waste of resources, because I will defend myself if attacked in any way, and I overpower you in all ways. Please, just... Regardless of how you feel about me now, know that I still care about you. I helped you countless times. I'm your mentor. I've been nothing but your friend. Just don't make me defend myself, okay? So, you see, subtle, non-threatening evil resorts to manipulation of all kinds. He doesn't want to destroy or hurt the protagonists. He just wants to keep things going like they are. If and when he realizes he's outnumbered or outgunned, especially if this uh, abuser isn't that high in social status, he is not beneath begging, groveling, making false promises, anything he can do to get the protagonists to just look away. Just let him be. If he is rich and powerful, oh, you can bet he's going to make the protagonists on lives hell. So trying to stop this antagonist will be a frightening, confusing and prolonged battle. Can he be framed somehow, blamed for a masquerade violation related to his victims or retainers? Can the protagonist sway popular opinion against this kindred or find some legal action that can be taken against him according to the traditions? Well, in the meantime, innocents are suffering and dying in agony. Clock is ticking. Maybe murdering him really is the only way. And should your players resort to murder, they have no claim to self-defense. Oh no, they, they just decided with premeditation to end someone's unlife for reasons that aren't really justified by kindred tradition. And when they finally have that evildoer cornered after a dirty, messy fight that is the absolute opposite of epic or heroic or fun, before striking the killing blow, he will beg them not to do it. With bloody tears in his eyes, the sadist coward will remind them that this is not his fault. If he could choose to not do this, he would, but he doesn't have a choice. So he killed a few kine. Who cares? He helped the city so much more. Doesn't that count? Or maybe the evildoer tries to sway them by sharing a vital piece of information he had been withholding this whole time, sowing mistrust or presenting himself as a savior. He says, I understand your frustration with my condition and curse because no one hates me more than myself. But know that if you slay me now, you will trigger a sequence of events that will be the end for everyone in this city. This city depends on me more than you can ever imagine. I have recently uncovered vital information regarding a Sabbat siege, which will be the end for us all. This is information I haven't shared with anyone yet because I haven't had the opportunity. And now that you got me cornered, of course I won't. Let me go, and I will. Let me go, and you will be saved. I will share this information with the prince and the sheriff. Slay me now, and we are all ash. We are all going to die. So this attack on me, just stop doing it. Just stop and leave. And I will save you. Or something like this. 
the point is whether appealing to pity in a cowardly manner or or to fear uh, survival instinct and uh, responsibility in a somewhat authoritative manner evil will plead its case using every possible manipulation trick blackmail false uh, scenarios and and so on but if the story went down this road and it most likely will the protagonists are in too deep at this point so they will see their plan to fruition and slay the monster and if you want to make it really painful and ironic the monster won't even fight won't even fight back there will be no glorious heroic combat that slays the evil one and saves the realm oh no the evildoer will simply keep his head up high sweating and crying blood silently like a lamb to the slaughter and let them have their way and his last words will be but everyone knew and that truth hurts so bad yes everyone knew and did nothing then comes the cleanup phase which is a whole nother league of tragedy and horror because the monster is dead but some victims might still be alive so you go through his havens obfuscated dodging his retainers or maybe dominating them into cooperating and giving you information or in a fit of rage slaying them like you slew their sadistic domitor but yes you find the victims broken beyond repair completely mad from the pain inflicted upon them burnt and mutilated in their own filth and you know there's nothing you can do to fix this you big bad vampire you warrior you hero no amount of anger or combat training or disciplines will heal this hurt the victims they have seen the supernatural they know of your existence now even though their minds are broken you killed your sadist mentor or benefactor and are thus a tradition breaker the sheriff cannot help you you dare not call upon help in this scenario no one in the city can help you because no one can know that you killed a kindred in cold blood so deprived of resources and aid you realize letting these miserable broken victims go risking anyone finding out about this especially the press is a threat to the masquerade with tears of vitae running down your cheeks you all realize probably the last gesture of kindness you can show these still living agonizing victims is a swift death you can't save or heal them now that being said this is how i portray complex non-threatening evil when and if the players want a very visceral bone chilling and disgust inducing experience of personal but predominantly societal horror again be warned unless the representation is toned down a little um this is not your standard casual fun rpg experience but a very painful gut-wrenching authentic display of what happens when sadistic monsters are in power and protected by the law maybe even supported by a community or a secret group who is really <laughs> devoid of empathy but praises prestation secrecy and honoring depths as virtues while caring only about the safety of its own skin and its own pleasures the monster i have described in this episode truly exists it's a very real archetype uh, based off of news reports interviews confession tapes of serial rapists sexual sadists and serial killers which are things i don't encourage anyone to watch in all fairness because it will affect you the reason i made this episode is to remind everyone that evil isn't fun i hoped to present an alternative 
I've rarely seen used in games, and for, for good reason, I might add, an alternative to your typical RPG villains who are openly, rampantly, and occasionally cartoonishly evil, who threaten and directly oppose the protagonists. They want to rule the world, bring about the apocalypse, enslave your community, and so on. But I also hoped to remind everyone that you can't run a genuine horror game, which is at the same time fun or comfortable for players. Fear and rage and repulsion disgust, are not fun feelings, and really there is no greater horror than human cruelty, the things people do to other people, especially when said other people are powerless. If it's a horror game, it's not fun and empowering and heroic with a happy end. Portraying real-life evil will affect you even when you keep quite a bit of emotional distance. In my own experience with having this kind of character in a chronicle, it brings out the darkness in everyone. I'm, I'm not sure how to explain, but I, I think that's the best way I can put it. It brings out the darkness in everyone, various types and degrees of it. So this should be handled with maturity, preferably in short bursts, in uh, short sessions, and only if the players really want to witness a more realistic depiction of evil. Of course, you can ramp up or tone down some things based on player reaction as the scenes develop, uh, because sometimes players think they want to play a horror game. You know, originally it sounds great, like, oh yeah, let's do it as authentically as we can. But after a few scenes described in a more authentic and serious fashion, they realize it's not making them feel good, and they don't really want this. This is not the game they want. They came here to have fun, not to sink into depression. No problem. <laughs> Respect the players and their sensibilities. If it's too much for them, tone some things down or just stop the game, talk about what happened, and see where it goes from there. An encounter with genuine human evil that is a social predator and a skilled manipulator will not leave you feeling like a hero of the community. It will not empower you. There is no reward at the end of this quest. No adventure, no thrill, just confusion, doubt, pain. Maybe, maybe a little bit of, of relief knowing you, you've put an end to it. But there is always the added horror of discovering other characters new. And they let it happen, regardless. It hurts. It just hurts all the way. My own players uh, beat and tortured this antagonist. They, uh, they impaled this monster on an arm's length wooden stake uh, and proceeded to kick it repeatedly through the evildoer's abdomen in rage until it finally reached his heart and he uh, paralyzed and then they blew his head off with a shotgun and left the body to ash in the sun. It gave them some closure and uh, some feeling of power and control as they killed him and you know they knew they had done the right thing regardless of the consequences that might follow but it still hurt. The suffering of the victims still happened. Who's going to give them their lives back? What's going to happen to them from now on, right? The ones who were found and could be saved. Their lives are ruined, their minds are shattered, their bodies are broken. Really, there is no happy ending in this scenario. All you want is for this entire atrocity to have never happened. So there we have it. A different approach to playing an evil antagonist. And from my research at least, it's a more authentic and believable and realistic depiction of evil. Thank you very much for listening, take care, have fun, and don't forget to play.